Hi, I'm Kath Bollard and uh, I just chaired uh, the recent session at the IWNHL on virally associated lymphomas with Dr. Kieran Dunleavy from uh, George Washington University. Um, I am here to lead this discussion uh, with our uh, four speakers today. Um, first uh, was Ruth Jarrett who talked about EBV driven lymphomas. Uh, in particular Hodgkin lymphoma, and then Mark Rachowski talked about LYG, and then uh, Rich Little talked about HIV-associated lymphomas, and then my talk was focused on HIV and EBV-directed uh, T-cell therapies. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to each speaker to give uh, some of the bullet points of what they saw as the highlight take-home messages of their um, presentations and then we're going to uh, have a discussion about uh, what we learnt uh, from this session. So Ruth, I'm going to start with you. Uh, could you uh, perhaps just give us a, a high-level summary of uh, what was the uh, take-home points of your talk? Well, transformation by EBV is ex associated with expression of EBV latent antigens, and there are these can be expressed in different groups. So that when we transform B cells in culture, we get expression of a group of eight EBV antigens and some non-coding RNAs, and these are, as well as driving proliferation and preventing apoptosis in the cell, they also elicit strong uh, cytotoxic T cell responses so that usually these cells are contained by the immune response in healthy individuals, but when you get immunosuppression, you get outgrowth of these EBV positive cells leading to lymphomas and immunosuppressed people. And I think these are the lymphomas that we kind of think about when we think about EBV, but it's important to remember that there are many other lymphomas associated with EBV where there is not overt immunosuppression but there is probably some kind of um, abnormality in the host response to EBV and the control of the EBV infection. And these uh, lymphomas include Hodgkin lymphoma, where you get a restricted form of EBV gene expression with just the EBNA1 protein and LMPs, and then Burkitt lymphoma, where you have an even more restricted form of EBV antigen expression with just the EBNA1 protein, and in some cases the BHRF1 protein. So can you just um, just give me the bullet points about um, the gene genetic predispos predispositions for these uh, EBV associated lymphomas? So we've largely looked at um, in Hodgkin lymphoma, both looking at HLA associations and also doing GWAS studies. And what's very clear for Hodgkin lymphoma is that there are very strong HLA associations. And these differ depending on when the, whether the tumours are EBV positive or negative. So for EBV positive Hodgkin lymphomas, most of the risk is in HLA class 1, although there are also class 2 associations. And here we see that HLA a0101 is a risk factor for Hodgkin lymphoma and HLA0201 is protective. And just if you compare homozygotes for these two alleles, you see about a tenfold difference in risk of Hodgkin lymphoma. So it's a big effect by these very common HLA alleles. Okay, that's very helpful. So thank you very much. And uh, Mark, over to you if you could uh, talk uh, at high level about LYG and uh, what you want the audience to have remembered uh, after sure. your talk. <laughs> sure, absolutely. So. LYG is called, um, is the nickname of lymphomatoid granulomatosis. So that's an example of one disease that's driven by EBV um, that comes in a very specific way to patients. Um, what I wanted to focus on with my talk broadly was EBV driven lymphoproliferative disorders in general. I mean, effectively, what has to happen to get that is you have to be effect infected with EBV and then you have to somehow not maintain control of that EBV inside your, in, inside your B cells. So most of us are infected with EBV, uh, but it's a small number of patients that actually have loss of immune control of EBV. When they do, it comes in a variety of settings, and that's what causes the trouble in knowing how to manage them. So since it comes in different flavors, in some cases lymphoma, which we typically always think that chemotherapy is the best treatment for patients with lymphoma. In other situations, it comes out like LYG. 
And what LYG is, is it doesn't involve the lymph nodes. It involves other organs, such as the lung and the brain. And in many situations, restoring that patient's immunity, either by um, removing the thing that um, affected their immunity, or even in situations where you stimulate their immunity with interferon, can actually get rid of the entire disease process. It doesn't get rid of the EBV, it gets rid of the disease that's causing them symptoms, so on and so forth. But the story is a little more complex because there's cases of LYG where it does behave like a lymphoma and it does need chemotherapy. And so um, when you look at it underneath the microscope, you can get clues to that based on the grading system. Um, and then anytime we give chemotherapy, we can affect someone's immune system. So it's actually true that with LYG, after you get rid of their aggressive lymphoma, their aggressive LYG, they can have an impairment in their immune system and then they can get the low grade of LYG, which again has to do with their immune system. So the point is, is we're learning a lot about the relationship between viruses and the immune system and lymphoma. And I think the newer tools that we heard discussed will be very useful as we think through when we give chemotherapy and when we reach for immunotherapy. Thank you. So I think um, the power of the immune system is obviously uh, something that's a big topic of, of this uh, meeting today as okay. well. Um, so Rich, um, can you give us the high level of uh, where you feel things are at with HIV associated lymphomas? Yeah, the main point I was trying to make today is that for the common HIV associated lymphomas, the clinical trials data indicates that these patients have equivalent outcomes to the background population. And because these are rare diseases, attempting to do randomized studies specific to HIV is no longer feasible, and these patients should be included on background tri trials, phase two and three trials, um, that determine clinical benefit. On the other hand, the rare tumors that are often associated with viruses such as EBV, KSHV, um, that often occur at low CD4 cells still are happening for, because there are populations of patients who are not available to the benefits of anti-HIV therapy. And they come in um, with advanced AIDS complications and immune depletion. And these patients do require specific study. The challenges of getting these rare patients onto trials that will enable a better understanding, though, has inherent challenges because of the, the, the few numbers, the populations of patients who have these diseases oftentimes don't have access to uh, big medical centers. And so that remains a big challenge that needs specific focus. Okay, no, I mean, I think that was really a very uh, sobering point um, that, you know, many of us are not including uh, this population in our clinical trials, and yet they are, um, they should be included, and they are doing as well uh, as, as you say, the HIV-negative um, population.